Today on Growing Boulder, he walked away from the biggest job in his industry at the peak of his career. Dan Patrick reveals the motivation behind his stunning move and shares the health struggle that nearly did him in. I was depressed. I had suicidal thoughts. It was, I was emotional. I'd cry for no reason, the smallest things. And I kept thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm Laura Savini with a lesson on the power of socialization. These nonagenarian tennis ladies say friendship is the name of the game. And Mike Leonard takes a look at the greatest equalizer of all, time, and our efforts to slow, stop, and remember. These stories and more today on Growing Boulder. We're not made to withdraw from life. We're made to seize each moment and to value every breath. We're made to be bold, to take risks, and to help others. We are the most creative, fearless, passionate being that has ever walked the face of the earth. Don't identify with limitation. Embrace possibility. This is not the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of what's next. This is Growing Bolder. Hi, I'm Mark Middleton, and this is Growing Boulder, where we share the stories of ordinary people that are living extraordinary lives, and occasionally the stories of celebrities whose personal struggles are something we can all learn from and be inspired by, and that's where we begin today. Dan Patrick was at the pinnacle of his profession, but he wasn't happy, and then he faced a health challenge that had him thinking of suicide. It was a growing bolder attitude that helped him not only survive, but thrive in the aftermath of both challenges. Dan Patrick is one of the biggest names in sports broadcasting history, but his journey to the top of his profession has been anything but easy. Unable to get an anchor job in small town USA, Patrick drove to CNN headquarters in 1983 and talked his way into a job as a sports reporter. I didn't think I could get a job in this business, nearly quit, and I, I got lucky, but I was good when I got lucky. If I wasn't good, then I, it didn't matter if I was getting an opportunity, I would have failed. In 1989, Patrick was hired by ESPN, where he anchored SportsCenter, a.k.a. The Big Show, with Keith Oberman, arguably changing the face of sports casting forever with their witty and irreverent approach to delivering highlights. In 2007, he walked away from what's considered the biggest job in his industry, a move that Sports Illustrated's Rick Riley called one of the top five biggest career mistakes in entertainment history, along with Shelley Long leaving Cheers and Katie Couric leaving The Today Show. I wasn't happy. I wasn't around my kids, my wife. Um, you know, I always tell people the better you are in this business, the worse your hours are, because you'll be working late at night or early in the morning. And I, I just, I didn't see my kids during the week. Patrick put his energy into the nationally syndicated Dan Patrick Show, which he simulcast from a studio in his attic to over two million listeners and viewers every week. Life was good until he began experiencing intense joint pain throughout his body. So everything hurts. Every morning, varying degrees. Uh, there were days I couldn't put my shoes and socks on. There are days I, we had to bring all my clothes downstairs because I couldn't climb stair, steps. He was diagnosed with severe polymyalgia rheumatica, painful inflammation of nearly every joint in his body. In an effort to relieve the intense pain, he self-medicated, taking Vicodin to play golf and drinking at night to sleep. He was prescribed prednisone, an anti-inflammatory steroid that helped relieve the pain, but led to a very dark place. I was depressed, I had suicidal thoughts. It was, I was emotional, I'd cry for no reason, the smallest things, and I kept thinking, I don't wanna do this anymore. He found hope at a clinic in New York where he was given light chemo through an IV once a month. The treatment relieved his pain, but once again, there were difficult side effects. I was having brain fog, I, I had memory loss. I went to the grocery store one time to buy salad dressing. And I got there, I forgot why I was there, walked around for 30 minutes, and I brought home olives. I forgot how to turn on my car. 
Patrick is renowned for an encyclopedic knowledge of sports. When he began to forget well-known names and events on air, he knew that he had to share his private struggle with his audience. And there are days that aren't good, but you know what? They're a whole lot better than they were before. But there were times when I would just brain freeze. I couldn't think of something. And you're live on the air for three hours, and it's radio and it's TV. And I heard from so many people. That's what was great is just, hey, thank you for sharing, because it's as honest of a moment as I've ever had in my life. And then you feel really vulnerable, and then after a while you go, so what? Like, you know, I'm not impenetrable. Who can So what? You cried on the air. I, I don't regret any part of it, because sometimes people want somebody that they can relate to that may have what they have. Patrick has completed his chemo regime. He's off prednisone, his pain is manageable, and his brain fog is gone. His career is going strong, and he's found a unique, creative, and powerful way to give back, the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting at Full Sail University. It started five years ago as kind of, I don't know, it was a fleeting idea, and I kept coming back to it. Like, how do I give students the answer to the test before they take the test. My promise was you'll get the best education in sports broadcasting you can possibly get. My name is attached to it. You will leave here better than any other student in America who wants to major in this. That's my word. Part of that education is to not try to be like him. ESPN anchor Scott Van Pelt once said of Patrick and Olbermann, they mocked the thing they were doing and did the thing they were mocking and were somehow the best at doing both. Success spawns imitation and it didn't take long for local sportscasters all over the country to become Dan and Keith wannabes. But what they made look effortless, witty irreverence is anything but. Patrick reminds his students that they're never more important than what they cover. Don't get in front of the product. The product is still the most important part of your job. We got to the point where I think we, we birthed quite a few sportscasters who thought they were the stars instead of the product that they were supposed to be selling. So yeah, I take full blame and, and partial credit. How's that? Dan Patrick has won nearly every sports casting award there is, but his greatest accomplishment, his lasting legacy, might very well be the school that bears his name. And I don't know if I've been happier, but it took one of those bold moments that you talk about where you go, bet on yourself, but also do it for the right reasons. This had nothing to do with money, notoriety, prestige. It, it was, I, I better find some happiness here or I'm gonna have all the, the awards you can have and all of the job assignments, and I'm not gonna ha really have anything. And that, that's, that's powerful, it really is. If that's my lasting mark, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. So what can we learn from Dan Patrick? Here are three quick takeaways that jumped out to me. Number one, we all get to define what success means to us. Teaching kindergarten might represent success to one person, while running a global corporation might represent it to another. What makes a successful marriage, a successful vacation, or a successful meeting? There is no black or white. You get to choose. Number two, everyone, no matter how perfect their life might seem, is battling something. That's life. And an important key to not just surviving, but thriving, is to share your struggle and not be afraid to ask for help. And number three, true satisfaction comes not from fame or fortune, but from giving back, from finding a way to make a difference in the lives of others. At the age of 99, Sky Bergman's grandmother was still working out of the gym. How cool is that? So Bergman got a camera and took it with her. What she got was so amazing, it inspired her to make a documentary, not just on her grandmother, but on the dozens of others willing to share the secrets to a life well lived. Sky Bergman has always seen things a little differently, and it's helped her become an acclaimed photographer and a college professor. But she never expected what happened when she aimed her camera at a place where few want to look. Forward, ahead in life, towards advanced age. But it's there she discovered a treasure. It was almost, she felt, like a map to the secrets of a life well lived.
I always say that everyone has a story to tell if you just take the time to listen. Listen is what she did, but what she heard was priceless. A life well lived is accomplishing your goals. Being happy, loving people, and being peaceful within yourself. I think what keeps me going is my own internal curiosity. People will say to me, you're so curious. And I think it's important in life is taking chances and risking facing new situations, learning new skills, and not getting in a rut. If you can say that I've made the world a better place because I've gone through it, then I think that's a life well lived. Live one day at a time. <laughs> Tomorrow comes soon enough. She focused on the lives of 40 people, old in age and strangely compelling. Watching makes you wonder if you might be getting a glimpse of your own future, something Bergman first thought about with her grandmother. When she was about ready to turn 100, I went back and filmed her working out at the gym. Wait, and, wait, 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 what? Uh, yeah, I know. She used to work on her exercise and lift weights. And I want to tell you, she didn't start working out till she was in her 80s. So it's never too late to start working out. She had a phrase, move it or lose it. And um, she really lived that. So I thought, well, I better film her because nobody's going to believe that at almost 100, she's still working out at the gym. And just as a throwaway comment, I said to her, Grandma, do you have some words of wisdom? And that was the beginning of this whole project. A project that started Bergman down a path of unexpected twists and turns, fighting against the fallacy that increasing age means diminishing value, revealing a source of wisdom that's there for all of us to benefit from that instead we tend to isolate and ignore. One of the things that I learned when I was doing the research for the film is that the last hundred years is the first time in human history that we've looked to anyone other than our elders for advice. We look at our cell phones and you think about young people, they don't necessarily have that connection of a grandparent or an elder in their life to ask questions to. And I really feel the world is suffering as a result. Suffering is a recurring theme. Nearly everyone in the film talks of facing something unthinkable, fighting in war, fighting for food, the sting of racism. We were taken out of our homes, we had to leave everything, and we could only take what we could carry. The civil rights movement. I would be on the picket lines all the time. And coping with separation, loss, and death. The film reminds us that wounds don't always show on faces. Yes, Bergman had stumbled onto something more profound than even she realized. It was not only about their words of wisdom, but also about the stories that they had and the legacy that they had and their history and how they overcame some really terrible times in their lives and still were such positive people and that those stories really needed to be told. They are stories that are fascinating on their own, but even more important for what they can teach us about ourselves. Stories we can use as an invaluable guide to help direct our own difficult choices as we move forward, if we open our lives to those who came before. Just because somebody's older doesn't mean that they haven't experienced the same things you've experienced. In fact, they've experienced it and they might be able to give you some advice on how to move through life so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. Don't yearn for things, they don't make you happy. You don't get lucky without working very hard for things. But inevitably there's something wonderful that will happen. Don't sweat the little things. Marriage is like a rubber band. You can only stretch it so much. Work a little less, spend a little less, enjoy life a little more. I want to live a life well lived, and so I want people that are role models for that. What can I look forward to? What should I be doing so that when I get to the end of my life, I feel like I've lived a life well lived. A life well lived is what we all want. It's why your film has made such a connection. You know, one of the things that I like to leave audiences with is the words of wisdom from my grandmother, which is, she always said, it's always better to be kind than right. And um, she lived her life just being kind to people. And what a better world this would be if we were all kind to someone. Be kind to everyone. Enjoy life to the limits. I'm grateful for all I have and the love of God and my family. That's it now. Arrivederci. Ciao. 
The film is called Lives Well Lived and it's airing on public television stations all across the country. When we need advice, isn't it smart to get it from the people who've been through it? This is a film that helps us appreciate, respect and value older people for their experience, their wisdom and their willingness to help make a difference. Learn more at growingbolder.com slash TV. Hi, I'm Laura Savini. If there was something you could do to increase your chances of being healthy and vital for many years to come, would you make the effort? Well, get ready, because there is something you can do. It's called finding your tribe. The tribe is made up of friends who motivate and encourage each other to stay physically active. There is startling news from the Centers for Disease Control. Get this, 80% of us just don't get enough physical activity. So are you the 80 or the 20? Well, here's some inspiration from a group of women, all between the ages of 75 and 96, who found a way to make exercise more fun. I'm Jean Carolyn, and I'm 96, and I uh, love to play tennis. Yes. Hasn't anybody told you, 96 is too old to play tennis? Well, it's too old. <laughs> but not that. <laughs> I swim a lot. I do water aerobics. I uh, play a lot of bridge. Did you ever expect that life at 96 would be like this? No, I didn't. I thought I'd be long gone. <laughs> First one in, please. Hi, I'm uh, Harriet Freeman. Uh, I'm 90 years old. It's something that I started when I was in my 40s, and uh, I liked it, and it made me feel good because I was using my body. So when are you gonna wind down? I'm not, if I have my way. <laughs> Life in your 90s is good? Yes, it's very good. Oh, I also have a boyfriend. I have a friend who's exactly the same age as I am. We come from the same backgrounds. And she's sitting in a senior citizen home waiting to die. She's not doing anything. And I feel so bad for her. Hi, Louise Johnson, 71. I think it's really, really wonderful. I love to hear those things. And it gives me hope that I can continue into my 90s. Hi, I'm Jerry Weber. I'm 72. I'm Barbara Weber, no relation to Jerry, and I happened to turn 80 last month. It's a wonderful life. It really is. It's a wonderful part of our life to be out here when we can. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Never sit home. That's right. That's right. Hi, I'm Anna Sullivan, not 71. <laughs> <laughs> My doctor says that this is the best thing I can do for myself. It's better than any medication, it's better than anything else. The exercise, stretching, running, it, it's just good for you. I have a husband at home with Parkinson's, and that's been the thing that they talk about and emphasize with him is exercise. Do you guys get that other people look at you and they say, I just don't think I could ever do that? Yes, and that makes me happy. <laughs> I, I, yeah, because we're still doing it. And I really do encourage other people to do it because they can. Oh, do you know my grandchildren tell me I'm the fastest runner that they know? It's the truth. And because... we make her practice. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a generation or so ago, that never happened. It never no. happened. Oh, no. My grandmother sat at the kitchen table until she died in 90, at 92. I mean, what? kind of joy could she have had out of life if she had just gotten involved in something that her kids were involved in. <laughs> they think, well, you're crazy to get out there in that heat and that sort of thing. And, yeah, so, and get, it, get up that early in the yeah. morning. I mean, who would want to do that? Yeah. We would. Yes, yes, we would. yes definitely. Yes. How important are the rest of these ladies to you? Very important. Very important. I, I find uh, without them, I'd be friendless. <laughs> I've met so many people through tennis that it's made my life so much richer. I play six days a week. Oh, no. And I, I make sure that each day is going to be filled were, were and fun. Right now is the best time of my life. 
we're getting our eighth great-grandchild this November, wow. and life is perfect. Keep moving, keep doing stuff, and keep your friends. It's great. I, I enjoy life. So how do you find your tribe? Well, first, identify what it is that you're interested in. Then explore a bit online to find affiliated groups. Believe me, there is a group for everyone and everything. Your librarian or even a grandchild can help you with this step. Every interest, activity, and cause attracts a tribe of people with a shared passion. Discover your tribe, that community of like-minded people, and get involved. When you open yourself up to opportunities, experiences, and adventures, you will find your tribe and you'll find your fulfillment. Mike Leonard is one of America's most celebrated storytellers. He's a modern-day Will Rogers with a video camera. His profound essays graced the Today Show for over 30 years, and now he's back on Growing Boulder. Today he's sharing his thoughts on something we all have in common, a limited amount of time. Thank you, Mark. It's clear that we can't make more time, but we certainly can make more of our time a realization that for some reason has resided in my soul for as long as I can remember. This is how it began, on a sidewalk in Hubbard Woods, Illinois. That's me in the front on the right, making my first appearance in a home movie. The time was right. America in the 1950s was full of kids and first-time filmmakers like my dad and mom. Regular folk who now had access to a new wave of inexpensive, easy to operate eight millimeter movie cameras. No sound, no experience necessary, obviously. Each roll of film recorded about three and a half minutes of action. If action translates to walking toward the camera while smiling, that was the go-to on-camera move of the era for the simple reason that most movie camera toting people of that era were totally in the dark, often very dark, when it came down to the question of what to shoot and how to shoot it which is too bad because my dad and mom, and so many others like them, had noble intentions. They were trying to do what humans have always tried to do, either with photography, or painting, or sculpture, or charcoal drawings on a cave wall, and that is to capture a moment, to grab and hold on to a few precious seconds of a life that can't be contained. It's a never-ending task, and after a while, most people grow weary of the effort reaching for the movie camera on fewer and fewer occasions. That's what happened in our house. The gaps in our home movie timeline growing bigger and bigger until the family projector finally went dark for good sometime before my 10th birthday. A decade passed. Then in August of 1969, I bought a movie camera. The new and improved Super 8 model with a better lens, but still no sound. Still only three and a half minutes of film per roll. Kathy and I were engaged to be married the following June, after my final year of college, my last season as a college hockey player. The Vietnam War was dragging on, while society was moving on, shedding traditions and customs in a style and manner never before seen in America. Life was changing rapidly, and I was in the middle of it all, focusing my camera on moments big and small, fighting my battle with time and learning along the way that the payoff didn't come when the film was developed. It was the act of filming that seemed to make life slow down by peering through a viewfinder for a better angle of a quiet moment, by climbing onto the roof of our house for a more dramatic view of a simple stroll down the sidewalk, by framing even the most ordinary aspects of life in ways to be noted and remembered. Once that realization kicked in, I knew that my grip on the movie camera would never loosen, and that my only chance of making any kind of impact in life was tied to those bits and pieces of life that tie all of us together. How many times have you said, where did the time go? Lately, I've been thinking a lot about how time seems to pass more quickly with each passing year. Of course, time moves at exactly the same pace as it did when we were kids, but our perception of time does change as we age. It changes because very little is brand new. 
We've been there and done that. And our brain, in its never-ending need to recognize and dismiss anything that's non-threatening, begins operating on a kind of autopilot that keeps us from living in the moment. Neuroscientists tell us that paying close attention to the here and now, practicing mindfulness, actually slows down our brain's perception of time because we're processing more input. There is only this moment, and it actually expands or contracts according to our mindfulness. The challenge is to understand that each moment is unique and to stop our brains from dismissing it. We have to learn to be mindful of the moment, otherwise we'll always be wondering, where did the time go? We'll see you next time on Growing Boulder. about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can go bold when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook and Instagram. Get Growing Boulder Magazine four quarterly issues delivered to your home for $29.97 a year. A companion book, Growing Boulder by Mark Middleton, is available as well for $25 plus shipping and handling. Growing Boulder membership includes access to a robust online platform featuring tools, tips, and resources in personal finance, functional fitness, caregiving, brain health, entrepreneurism, and more. Available for $30 for one year. Order online at growingboulder.com TV.